Well, we're going to find our scripture today is in 1 Kings, the 19th chapter. 1 Kings 19. We're going to interrupt an account, a very well-known account to those who know the Old Testament, of Elijah and his encounter, his battle with the prophets of Baal, the prophets of Asherah. We find that listed in the on Mount Carmel. It's, it's on the 18th chapter, rather, in the 18th chapter of 1 Kings. And in that account, we find that Elijah goes before King Ahab. King Ahab, interesting enough, refers to Elijah and says, are you, here, are you the one that troubles Israel? You're the troubler of Israel. I would like you to keep your mind, if you would, connected with the events that are taking place currently in our world and in our own nation. And I want you to contemporize, if you would, would this account and draw lines of parallelism, if you would, between those two accounts. Are you, the, you are the one who's troubling Israel. Seems to me today that many liberals and those who are woke, those who are the elite liberal class, blame many of our problems upon those Christians. And we see that repeated today, and it is nothing new. It is the same accusation as Elijah faced thousands of years ago when he came before the government powers in place in that time. And Elijah responds to the king and says, it's not me that's causing trouble in Israel. Our condition and what we're facing is not a result of me. It's a result of you. It's a result of your life. It's a result of what you're doing, the way that you're leading our nation. And so he challenges the king to have it out, so to speak. Let's get this over with. Let's find out who really is God. And he tells the king to gather all of the prophets, 450 prophets of Baal, 400 prophets of Asherah, and to bring them, he said, these are the number of prophets that eat at Jezebel's table, Jezebel being his wife. In other words, the king and his wife, the government per se, was supporting 850 men who reportedly were prophets of these other gods. We'll talk about that in a few moments. And he tells them to bring those prophets, everyone you can muster, bring them up to the top of Mount Carmel. Elijah says, I will meet you there and we're going to have it out. The God who answers by fire, we will declare God. It seemed good to the prophets of Baal. It seemed good to the prophets of Asherah. It seemed good to Ahab. Evidently, Jezebel let them go. And the day comes and they all meet on top of Mount Carmel. He gives them their shot first. They lay their sacrifice down. They prepare everything according to what their religion would tell them. And they begin to call out to their God. And they begin to do everything that according to their mystical books and, and writings would tell them to do. And in, fa and in fact, they become so, so desperate. They begin to cut themselves. The Bible says in chapter 18 that blood began to gush out of their bodies. And at that point, Elijah is so emboldened and full of faith that he begins to taunt them. And he says, well, maybe your God's taking a break. And he even uses a reference to the bathroom. Maybe your God had to use the bathroom and he's not hearing you. And in front of everyone, he taunts them and he says, all right, you're done. Your time is over. And then, as you well know, he poured three times, he poured barrels of water on the sacrifice that he, would, that he had prepared. And he prayed a very short prayer and fire fell from heaven. I would have loved to have seen that. I can only imagine that it was somewhat like a, uh, a jet engine coming down and, and, and lighting up. It said it licked up the, the sacrifice and all of the water. And the people fell on their face. The thousands of people that were up there for the showdown fell on their face, said, God, he is God. No kidding. I mean, what else would you need to, to see to prove that? God, your God is God. And they began to kneel down and worship the true God of Israel. Now, Elijah wasn't done. Single-handedly, he told them to capture, gather, capture all of those false prophets, 850. And he took them over to a stream and single-handedly, with a sword, he killed every one of them. Now, that's a lot of work, ladies and gentlemen. In case you don't know it, that's, that is a lot of physical work to kill 850 people with a sword. And it, it, we can only imagine what it would have been like. And he says afterwards, he went to pray, 
the, the drought was broken, rain fell, and then Elijah is spent, and Jezebel makes a threat on his life, and Elijah runs away. Physically, emotionally, spiritually, he's empty. And he runs away, and he's so tired he falls asleep. But God then asks him, when he's ready to hear, God says, what are you doing here, Elijah? And Elijah makes the statement we find in 1 Kings 19, 14. And we're going to read that today as our text, and then God responds to him, and this will form the basis of our text today. This is Elijah speaking, and he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. That's true. Because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They've torn down your altars. They've killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left. Now he is speaking to a certain degree truth. It was only he against 850 other prophets on that mountain. One against 850. Literally one against a nation. Because the whole nation had turned against God. He said, I alone am left and they seek to take my life. That was the threat of Jezebel. God's response to Elijah lays out the plan that he has, but at the conclusion of that, in verse 18, he says this, and I wanted to form the base of what we're going to study today. He, God is speaking, he says, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. So as we said, idolatry, Baal worship, has consumed Israel and during the reign of King Ahab and his wicked wife Jezebel. But God here assures the discouraged prophet Elijah that though he doesn't see them, there are still people left in the nation who are his, and he has reserved them. And he refers to this group by the name remnant. He calls them a remnant. Now we see that repeated in the book of Romans when Paul to the Roman church is repeating this story and he illustrates it. And then in Romans the 11th chapter, verse 5, at the end of that verse, he says, so too at the present time there is a remnant chosen by grace. Today I want us to consider the doctrine, what I call the doctrine of the remnant. The doctrine of the remnant, the teaching of of the remnant. What does the Bible teach? What can we summarize to be the general teaching of this group that is called the remnant that God is referring to? Well, first of all, we need to recognize that the remnant remains. The remnant remains, regardless of the persecution down through history, regardless in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament and down through history as we have it up to the present day, we find that regardless of the persecution, the oppression, regardless of the wars, regardless of the pressure, regardless of the resistance, God has always been faithful to preserve a remnant, a remnant being a small portion. That's what the word remnant means. It means small portion. In fact, in Isaiah 1.9, there's another reference to remnant. Except the Lord of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been, speaking about the people of Israel, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Now there's a Greek, Greek Septuagint translation of this, and when it says very small remnant, the Greek Septuagint uses the Greek word sperma. Unless God had left a sperma, a sperm, which means seed, unless God had left a little seed, all of Israel would have been destroyed like the residents of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what Isaiah is saying, that down through history, there have been precarious times, there have been ages, there have been seasons in which it seems as if God's people are going to all be destroyed. But, the, but history tells us, and the Word of God tells us, and here we find in the scripture that Paul is assuring Eli excuse me, God is assuring Elijah that there is yet a remnant. There is yet a group of people that Elijah can't see that are still faithful and serving him. In the United States, I've shared recently in polling that it continues to show that the number of people who hold a biblical worldview and a vibrant walk with Christ continues to decline. 
in our nation. Over the past several decades, America's culture's been transformed at a pace that is absolutely breathtaking. According to a 2023 Barna Research study, listen to this, only 4% of adults in America hold a biblical worldview. 2023, 4% of American adults hold a biblical worldview. That means 96% of the people that were surveyed, thousands upon thousands of people across reference survey, do not hold a biblical worldview. Now this coincides and parallels the fact that there's been a rapid decrease in biblical understanding and knowledge and literacy. People simply do not know the Bible. They're not reading the Bible. The most Bible people receive is perhaps what they listen to on YouTube or in church on Sunday. They're not studying their Bible, so they're relatively illiterate. And so they fall in biblical worldview, biblical worldview meaning that my life, my decisions, my future, all that I do, I act, the way I act, what I do, what I participate in, is guided by the principles contained within the Bible. And according to Barna, only 4% of the people in America, adults, are doing that. The number of adults who don't possess a biblical worldview, but still hold a substantial number of beliefs and behaviors consistent with biblical worldview, has also fallen dramatically. In other words, there's people that are living in America that are doing some things in their lifestyle that they may not even know that are in the Bible, but, but they are consistent with what the Bible teaches, even though their whole lifestyle is not. That's also fallen from 25% three years ago to only one in every seven adults, 14% that a portion of their life is in line with the Bible. Those are called emergent followers. But the bulk of the American adult population, 82%, fall into the world citizen category, uh, described as people who may embrace a few biblical principles, but generally believe and behave in ways that are different from biblical teaching. So 82% of the people may embrace a few biblical principles. In other words, these are people that might attend church. These are people that when you ask them, are you a Christian? They'd say, yes, I'm a Christian. These are people that would say, I believe in God, which is not a bad thing. I mean, that's a start. But they're, but they're so biblically illiterate, they, so, they are, have such an, an ignorant understanding. If you want to joke, get, get a discussion of the Bible going in the barbershop or, or at work and ask them what's in the Bible. You'll hear all types of things that they think are in the Bible that are not in the Bible. And so people basically are, are illiterate and their lifestyle is following that illiteracy. So... Truly, as in Elijah's day, when compared to the whole, there seems to be a, only a small seed of true believers, the true church, living their lives by biblical worldview out of, the, out of the church in America. But there is still a remnant that remains. God makes sure of that. The second thing we need to notice about the, the doctrine of the remnant is that the remnant retains the original. The remnant retains the original. The remnant contains a remnant, whether it be a people or a fabric or a carpet, retains all of the traits and elements, components, construction of the whole. In fact, it cannot be considered a remnant unless it has all of the qualities inherent in the original. If I have a remnant piece of carpet, it won't be exactly like the, if I have a small remnant piece of carpet, it will have all of the quality, all of the characteristics, the color, everything identical to the full original roll of carpet, or it's not a remnant. And so we can be assured that the remnant that remains, if it is a remnant and God has caused a remnant to remain, it will have the same characteristics as the original. If you want to see what the original is like, look at the remnant. If you want to see what the remnant is going to look like, look at the original. And so God then placed this qualification when he talked to Elijah. When he said, Elijah, I have reserved 7,000, they are a remnant. When he talked to him, when he told him, gave him that news, he had a qualification as to what characteristics the remnant had. God said, this remnant is a remnant 
because they are those who have remained true to me. And how did he qualify that? He said, I have reserved, Elijah, you feel all alone. You feel like you're, you, and you were on Mount Carmel all alone. And indeed, there are probably tens and tens of thousands of people. And for, for a long time now, you have been struggling forward on your own. But I want you to know that you can't see them, but there are 7,000. We believe that could be a symbolic number, maybe not an exact number. There are 7,000 who have, and he said, what's the quality? They have not bowed to Baal. All whose knees have not bowed to Baal and every mouth that has not kissed him. Now, Baal worship was, had taken over Israel and many other nations. It was, Baal was the chief god of the Canaanites. And this god is referred to in the Bible by both singular and plural terms. Sometimes the Bible in the Old Testament refers to the Baals. And, and Baal was the chief god. In fact, many other gods fell under the category of Baal. Every town had their own Baal. There was the, there was the Baal Hermon. There was the Baal Tamar. It would be like saying there's the Baal Salem. And all of the people in their towns had their own Baal. Baal was the god, the, the chief god, and he symbolized rebellion against God. Jonathan Kahn summarized it like this. To the nation of Israel, Baal was the embodiment of paganism. He was the epitome of all that was not God. He, was, he represented all that warred against God. Baal was the other God instead of God. He was the instead of God. He was Israel's anti-God. He was the God who separated Israel away from God. Baal was the God of turning away. And Israel was consumed with Baal worship. But God told Elijah, 7,000, a remnant, a group, a small group compared to the nation as a whole, have not bowed down, have not kissed which was an idol worship, kissed Baal. In other words, they have not surrendered. They've not turned away. They are still following me. They refuse to go the way of the nation of Israel. They are countercultural. They're standing up against the tide. They're swimming against the flow. These are individuals that I have reserved. And the reason they're my remnant is because they have not bowed down to the pressure of worshiping, serving, going the direction, living the lifestyle of Baal like the rest of the nation. That was God's qualification. A remnant retains the original. Now you and I are in the church age. And there is evidently from what we're seeing in the United States astonishing to me. And of course they, 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 they say that within the next decade, they are predicting that at the very minimum, 100,000 churches will close in the United States in the next 10 years. 100,000 churches. Churches are sitting relatively empty. There are churches in this, in this city, in, in this region, that have just a few followers, a few individuals that are still attending, trying to keep the doors open. And those who look ahead with statistics, believe that that's what's happening in America. There is indeed a great falling away. Yes, there are some mega churches. Yes, there are some very, very large churches. But by and large, followers of God have become literally a remnant, a small piece of the overall population. But if there is a small piece of the church remaining in America, what will it look like? Will it look like a certain congregation over here? Will it look like a certain denomination over here? Will it be this group? Will it be that group? You know, there's the old joke that when you get to heaven, Peter's taking some people around. And when I was part of a denomination, we used to joke with each other, and we used to say that Peter's taking a group of Christians, new arrivals in, around heaven. I don't know why Peter's always the, the guide in heaven, but he's taking them around. And they go, they go past this enormously high wall in the, city of, in the city, 
and, it, and it's a circular wall, but inside they can hear people cheering and they can hear people praising the Lord. And finally, the, the curiosity gets the best of these people. And they say to Peter, all right, this is beautiful, but who's on the other side of this wall? Who's in there? And he said, oh, that's, and he mentions the denomination. That's, that's the, the, you can put any denomination you want on it. We put them in there because they think they're the only ones going to heaven. And that's just so true. People think, well, who, what is the real church going to be like? Well, the real church and the remnant is going to be like the church we see in the Bible, particularly in the book of Acts. We see a church there that was filled with spiritual power. We see a church there that was, that was emboldened with passion and power. They were countercultural in their adherence to biblical values. They were loving. They were forgiving in the face of great hostility. They were compassionate towards those who were suffering and needy. History tells us that in the first three centuries, Christians were persecuted more than any other religious group. In fact, that is true still today. Because they refused to honor other gods and worship the emperor. They were seen as too exclusive, too narrow. They were seen as a threat to the social order. And we see that they were even persecuted to the point where Nero, it is recorded that Nero, under his reign, he would cover Christians with pitch and tar and put them up on post, and he would have orgies and parties in his gardens lit by the bodies of the Christians but they refuse to yield and worship the emperor. If there is a remnant peace remaining today in America, it will have the same characteristics of the early church. The remnant peace will be filled with the power of God. It will have a passion for following God. It will be one who follows the biblical values and will be countercultural without being afraid. It will be a remnant that is filled with the love of God and forgives and is willing to help those who are down and out. But it will be a remnant who will stand, stand in the face of great persecution and great opposition. The remnant of believers today would be totally different than those we read about in the book of Acts. With all of our scientific advancements, with all of the technology, well, my land, the comparison between us today and those that lived in the first century, there is no comparison. Their lives, our lives are completely different. In fact, they wouldn't even know what the word technology means. They wouldn't know what you were talking about. But I tell you this, that if we had the ability to meet one another and we could speak the same language, if, if the remnant today the remaining remnant in the United States and even in the world could meet the people of the first century, the church of Jesus Christ, we would find that there would be a witness of the Spirit and we would be one with each other despite our differences because we're from the same cloth. We are from the original. We would match. You know, you can take a piece of cloth and you can match it up to the original and it will match. And you can take believers today. Listen, there's not a first century version of the church. There's not a fifth century version of the church and then an 18th century version of the church and then a 21st century the version of the church. No, there's only one version of the church and it's listed for it, delineated, designated, described for us within the Bible. And that's why it's so important that we have a biblical worldview and we know what the Bible says. That is the church and those are the people that God Almighty calls the remnant today. The last point is this. The remnant is reserved by God. In the Bible, all down through history, as I've said, God has preserved the remnant. Notice that he said to Elijah very clearly, he said, Elijah, I have reserved. I have reserved. I am still in control. I still have a plan. What I've said, I'm going to do. No power, no throne, no ruler, no king, no Ahab, no Jezebel, no little god, Baal, no power is going, to, is going to derail me from my plan and my purpose. And I 
have reserved 7,000. You think the nation is done, Elijah, can't blame you. You have done well, my servant, but you're not alone, and I still have a plan. This reserve of God's people is not just for the survival and continuation of God's kingdom, but note with me that this reserve, this little remnant, this tiny little piece, this seed is who God works through for the completion of his eternal plan. Whether God saves by many or by few, it isn't too hard for him. It makes no difference. And it seems when we study the scripture, God seems to delight in using a few and coming up against seemingly insurmountable obstacles and barriers to show his strength. Do you remember when Gideon, when the Midianites, it says, had occupied the nation and they covered the land like locusts, the Bible says, hundreds of thousands. God raised up Gideon and Gideon called the men of Israel. God instructed me, said, all right, men, we're going to go to war. And he called the men of Israel to war. And only 32,000 responded in Judges, the seventh chapter. You say only 32,000, that sounds pretty good, but you have to remember the Midianites had hundreds of thousands, evidently, warriors. And so 32,000 gather in front of Gideon, and he's a little bit discouraged. And to his shock, he goes to the Lord, and the Lord says, that's too many. We're not going to go with that many. And through a process, finally through how they drank water, the Lord keeps telling Gideon, no, that's still too many. Can you imagine what's going through this man's mind? He's looking out, and the army of the Midianites is like locusts covering the earth. And God keeps telling him, too many, too many, until finally 300 men. And God says, okay, that's who I'm going to use. Right there. Give them, and it says they took, <laughs> they took all the weapons, they took all of the provisions, and they took the trumpets of the 32,000. 300. And as you well know, God used those 300 through the blowing of the trumpet and the breaking of the urn with light, the ves vessels with light, God used those 300 and the Midianites fled and turned on each other and a great victory was won by 300 bringing all the glory to God. We can see that down through history over and over and over again. It's repeated. It seems as if the, there is no one remaining of God's people. It seems as if the enemy has won the war. All down through history, all down through the dark ages, we could go down through history seeing that it looks like it's all over with. It seems like there are no Christians left. It seems like God's people are gone. We can even look at our own history. We can look back to England when there was great oppression. There was great um, religious oppression in, in England by the king. And there was, there was a little faithful little pilgrim band that got on some little ships. Compared to ships today, they're small. And they decide they're going to go over to this new land. And they, they will come over to this place. And they, they land. And in 1620, they, before they leave the boat, they make a covenant with God. And they say, here's why we're here. This little band, many of them die. The majority of them die because of the hardships they faced. But they survive. And somehow out of that is born the greatest nation on earth. Out of that is born this nation that is the envy of the world. People trying to get into this place, still trying to get in to this nation, even with all of its problems. Born out of a little band of people and people, little groups coming here, God using them. God did not choose America, but America chose God. Our forefathers chose God. We find amazingly early on, that it's incredible, but the people began to turn against God. The children and the grandchildren of those pilgrims did not have the same values, even then, even in the 17th century. And they began to turn away from God. Listen, the devil is, has been existing since humanity has been on earth. Temptation is temptation. He's not a creator. He's, he's, he's a copy machine. 
but he uses the same thing over and over again on every generation. And so those young people and the grandchildren began to turn away. They said church, churches were empty all over America, all over the colonies. And it's churches that did meet, they said, were dead. Don't have time to go into the details, but it got to such a point that there were some in the church that were still trying to follow God. They didn't believe there was any hope. Isn't that amazing? Back in the 1600s, the 17th century, the late 1600s, the early 1700s. And in fact, two pastors, Solomon Stoddard, who was a very well-known pastor, he's in some of our history books, some of the some of the history that I have in some of my books of early America. Solomon Stoddard was a pastor, and he was talking to Increase Mather. Increase Mather was a Puritan pastor in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. He became, by the way, president of Harvard College for 20 years. Increase Mather, M-A-T-H-E-R, and Solomon Stoddard are having somewhat of a disagreement. They believe, one of them believes, that Stoddard believes that it's over. He believed that America had gone too far, that there wasn't any hope for Christianity. They couldn't be redeemed. There couldn't be a revival. But Increase Mather responded to Stoddard and said this, and it's become famous. He said the fraction, he said Stoddard said there's only a tiny fraction of people remaining that still serve God. And Mather said, nevertheless, the fraction is sufficient to stand for the entire land and redeem the whole. <laughs> History records that after that discussion, shortly after, something began to happen in America, and it was called the First Great Awakening. Preachers like Jonathan Edwards and Whitfield began to traverse the nation and preach, and thousands began to gather. And the power of God, the power of God fell. Ladies and gentlemen, when we talk about the power of God, we're talking about the fact that every one of them, John Wesley, Whitfield, Edwards, those preachers on the, on the, the, the plains of America and the unsettled areas of Kentucky, they would record that while they were preaching, people physically fell, fell. And in some places they recorded that so many fell, they were like cordwood, the one said, stacked upon each other in the congregation, and they were afraid that they would smother. They, the power of God came to such a degree that people began to cry out aloud. During the preaching, they couldn't control themselves and ask God to forgive them. Strong men men of reputation in communities began to cry out. They couldn't help themselves, begging God to forgive them. Ladies and gentlemen, that is, that is the, a true revival. That is not something planned by a church. That's not something that we can organize. That's when God steps down. God steps down on the earth, and yet God begins to move. And all of a sudden, those things, those cases, those people, those things in lives that seem to be irredeemable and, and unchangeable and situations that it seems beyond the power of man, all of a sudden in a moment, by the power of God, lives are transformed. It is recorded that 82% of those in the first great awakening remained Christians and were faithful the rest of their life. Something happened. We find ourselves today that God has given us many blessings. We are so blessed it is incredible how blessed we are. We are so spoiled as a nation. We just have to admit that. We're spoiled. We love our comfort. We have for decades, we have, we have been lavished a great, even though we feel like we may not be wealthy compared to the rest of the world, we are. And we have been blessed with freedom and liberty. We are the envy of the world. And... and and because of that, we are the target of our enemies. I am diverting here a little bit, but I'm going to tell you that the march towards Marxism is what this is all about. This upcoming election is not like other elections. We've seen an incremental creep, but I believe that in this next election, if the right person is not elected, if the other party gets in, it will not be a creep towards Marxism. It will be the pedal to the metal. It will be the accelerator to the floor. 
One of the items that has to be destroyed in a march towards Marxism is religion and the faith of the people. It is repeated over and over again in the story of the march of communism and Marxism in other nations. They destroy religion, they destroy faith. Why? Why would they be after Christianity? Because Christianity is from where they know the principles that have made us a great nation originated, despite their denial. They know that the true sense of liberty, the true sense of freedom, those things that we enjoy, those things of justice, those things of being right, those were all derived. We didn't suck those out of our self-righteous thumbs. Those came from the Word of God. Those came from the Bible. So if I'm an enemy of this nation, and we have many, if I'm an enemy of this nation, I am going to destroy, I'm going to go after the core. I'm going to have to take away the morality of those people. And if the morality of those people is reflective of the teachings of Christianity, I'm going to have to destroy Christianity. Now that isn't in my notes, but that was free. And that's where we're at today. I keep telling you, I don't need to tell you anymore. But what I want to encourage us with is this. Our future is unclear. Nowhere in the Bible does it clearly speak of a nation. We're the most powerful nation in the world. And nowhere can we find our nation specifically named. Oh, I know there are those who say that we're the eagle or we're this or we're that. But nowhere really are we mentioned in the Bible. Prophecy mentions us nowhere. We are not assured that we survive. The average age of a surviving democratic republic is 250 years. We are right there. Our future is uncertain. We are right at the precipice. All the signs are pressing in upon us. And we don't know. Israel is called, Israel is going to survive. It says it clearly in the Bible. Israel will survive. But America is nowhere to be found. So where does that leave it? It leaves it up to you and I. That leaves the choice up to us. We are a democratic republic. We have the rulers that we have chosen. We have the leaders that we have chosen. We have the people in government that we chose. Now, granted, the people pulling the strings behind the scenes we didn't choose, and that needs to be changed. That corruption needs to be taken out. In this upcoming election, it is, be, it is up to you and I. But one thing is abundantly clear. If God saves America, and make no bones about it, it's going to take God to save America. If no government can change the hearts of the people, ladies and gentlemen, we can legislate, we can, we can enforce laws, but what you will have is a riot. You'll have a war. Unless the hearts of the people are changed and government cannot, government can change laws, but it cannot change hearts. How will this nation be saved? The same way God has worked miracles down through history. God has always had a people. He's always had a remnant. He's always had a small piece of the original that he purposely causes and protects. And there is a remnant left in the United States of America. There is a remnant. And I believe that God is calling that remnant to arise. In the history books, the great leaders of the earth and earthly governments are noted, and rightfully so. We can name them great leaders down through history. But it's interesting that in the overall picture and in God's book, from his perspective, it isn't those great leaders of earthly governments that are mentioned, but it is that little remnant, covenanted people of God, those considered to be the weak things. It is through these that God prioritizes and works. Let me give you a little illustration. In this book right here, we don't see the book of King Nebuchadnezzar. We don't see the book of King Belshazzar or King Darius or King Cyrus. No, we see the book of Daniel. Interesting. 
In this book, we don't see the, the book of King Ar Artaxerxes. We have the book of Nehemiah. We don't see the book of King Zedekiah or King Jehoiakim. We have the book of Jeremiah. So we see that in the eyes of God, it is that godly group of people upon which history pivots and turns. You and I, if you're part of the remnant, if you're living your life according to a biblical worldview, God is depending on his remnant to rise up. But here is the hope. The hope is that he's done it before. That seems to be the way he delights to work. And the earth may be judged and destroyed and however lost a nation be in despair, yet God always has a faithful remnant. They're purged, they're renovated, they're revived, and they become the foundation for God to move in the future. Only the remnant has the conviction and the willing to sacrifice, the devotion, the endurance, the message, and the power to change the world. Today, I tell you, we have reason to hope, and it is not because of a political candidate. I'm going to be preaching about that, by the way. I'm going to be preaching about platforms and what, is, what, what they're standing on. I'm going to get very specific. The time for us as preachers to veil our words and to hint and, and kind of refer to things is over. We, we... Preachers and pastors have to preach the truth and the whole truth and tell it like it is. But I want to tell you today that I have hope. My hope is this. I studied and saw that God works through a little seed. And my hope is, and I believe, that God is beginning to stir his remnant. And if his remnant, his people, will pray, 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 and then act and obey, if his remnant will do that, God will save America. And God will. God will give us new life. And it will not be in a small manner. It will not be in a little measure. When God reverses this thing, listen, when God reverses it, it's as radical as Elijah on Mount Carmel. When God reverses it, it's going to be radical. So let's obey God. Let's pray like we've never prayed before. Your prayers are powerful. Satan trembles when he sees the weakest saint on their knees. Let's pray. God hears our prayers. Let's call out to God. Let's repent. Let's start living as God would have us to. Let's ask him to give, it, give us boldness and courage. Let's open our mouths. Let's do the right thing. God, if God be for us, who can be against us? The Lord. I'll tell you, God has put me on fire. And I am not going to stop until I see this nation turn back to God. Nothing less. Nothing less, nothing else than total victory. That's what we're after. Well, I'm glad to hear some of you agree with me. But let us not leave discouraged. It is discouraging. I'll tell you what, you watch the news and it can get you down. But I'm going to tell you, you get in here and you see that we serve a God that is powerful and mighty and still on the throne and able to do exceedingly abundantly above anything we're able to ask for faith. Well, if I'm not preaching you happy, I'm preaching myself happy. Makes me feel better. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that we can still call upon you in the name that is above every name, in the name of Jesus. We thank you that down through history, you have revealed to us your actions through this little remnant, this little piece, this little seed. 
when it seemed as if all hope was gone, when it seemed as if there was no visible, tangible reason to believe that you worked mightily and miraculously through that band of believers, through those faithful few, through that 7,000 in one whole nation, you work through them to perform your miracles and obtain your purposes. We are today asking you to have mercy on America. We're asking you, O oh God, to have mercy upon this nation. And we're asking you, O oh God, to revive the remnant. May the remnant awaken. May churches across this nation awaken. May pastors be lit on fire by the Holy Spirit. May your word burn within their heart. May they, O oh God, not be able to keep their mouths silent. May they lift their mouths like a trumpet and declare the word of God in boldness and without fear or favor of man. And may your power go forth. May it not be the energy of the flesh. May it not be the power of man. But may your word go forth in power. And may families be changed and lives be changed and marriages healed and people set free and bondages broken and sin forgiven and people find peace and joy like they've never had before because Christ has become king of their life. May once again, O oh God, you be able to bring your blessing upon America because America is blessing you. It begins in the church and we pray, O oh God, revive your church even more so, revive my heart, O oh God. Revive my heart and touch me afresh and anew so that I have more than enough for the remaining journey and we can live victorious in and through the name of Jesus, carrying our head held high because greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. We thank you, O oh God, you're faithful and true. You will not forsake your own. You have promised to go with us. We are not the tail. We are the head. Christ is our King. The Holy Spirit is with us. The blood has power. And we are the victorious church that is marching forward. And we're marching forward towards complete victory. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen.